Now on Radio 4, here's Matthew Paris with the return of Great Lives. And this week, it's a Desert Island special. I was born in the city of York in the year 1632. If ever a man was born to be his own destroyer, then I was he. Against the good advice of my father, I went to sea. I forgot the terror that possessed me in my first voyage and voyaged into danger and calamity again. Even after deliverance from the Turks and landing safe in the Brazils, where I made my fortune, my heart still yearned to wander. We all know that feeling. My guests today certainly do. The clip you've just heard comes from an astonishing tale, The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, written by himself. That novel is 300 years old this year. Now let's play for a while with the idea that Crusoe was real, because in truth we have two great lives in this programme, Crusoe and his creator, Daniel Defoe, who lives in a way through his creation, as authors often do. Nominating him, or rather them, is the heroine of her own island adventure, and she is real, the author of the books Cast Away, Run Away and Far Away, Lucy Irvin. Let's begin very simply, Lucy. Where are you speaking to us from today? These days, uh, I live in a caravan in rural Bulgaria, surrounded <laughs> by rescued horses, but I've managed to get away from them, and uh, I'm in the town of Star Zagora in south-central Bulgaria. Ha has Bulgaria yeah. become a, a sort of... Uh, desert island for you? Very much so. You spent a year on Tuin, an island between New Guinea and Australia. Can you tell us how and why you ended up there? A short version of uh, that answer would be that I was quite bored working for the Inland Revenue as a clerk when I was 24 and I went out one lunchtime to a local library was skimming through adverts in Time Out and I saw a rather riveting one Writer seeks a wife, inverted commas, for a year on tropical island. And I thought, well, that'd be different. Um, of course, that's only the surface story. Wife, in inverted commas, you assumed you were going to be sleeping with him, is that right? Well, I assumed I'd be a sort of girl Friday. I wasn't particularly emancipated in those days. Um, he was quite a lot older, 26 years older than me, and a writer, and he'd already lived on other islands, including the one that they say Alexander Selkirk lived on, which he never actually did. And he sounded experienced, as though he knew what he was talking about. I didn't, of course, know in those days that what he'd written was a sort of pamphlety things, <laughs> rather like <laughs> Daniel Defoe, uh, with racy titles, and that went out to the public in brown paper packages. Um, and that also he edited a, a, a man's magazine, a gentleman's <laughs> magazine, called Mayfair. I assumed, I made assumptions about him that were incorrect. And he probably made assumptions about me that were equally incorrect. She works for the Inland Revenue, so she must be terribly straight-laced and have a bank account. And I wasn't really very straight-laced, and I'd done all sorts of peculiar things before that. The Round Island, with a single palm tree, has become a, a staple of cartoonists. Was Daniel Defoe, do you think, tapping into an almost universal human hankering? Or, or, or was it his book, The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, that spawned a whole genre of popular fiction like Swiss Family Robinson or Lord of the Flies and plenty of TV stuff as well? What, which no, came first? I I'm sure it, it was the image. Uh, I've thought about this quite a lot. I mean, the book definitely contributed hugely, but that image just says limited horizons, simplicity, warmth, beauty, a different life than the life I'm living now. And I think it says that to many, many people. The island as image is what has made the, uh, the whole desert island thing uh, catch on. Let's hear a bit more from Robinson Crusoe. Must swim. Keep swimming. Can't breathe. Must breathe. That's better. Now swim. Just swim. 
that was a reconstruction of the moment poor shipwrecked Crusoe first hit dry land, with Roy Marsden as the old Crusoe and Tom Bevan as the young man. I'm joined here in the studio by Martin Popplewell, who, over 30 years ago, saw a film called The Blue Lagoon and decided he wanted to live on a desert island too. And that's exactly what he did. How did that work out for you, Martin? Well, our arrival was a lot <laughs> less traumatic than, than the one which we've just heard. Though, in a sense, no less complicated. The Blue Lagoon, I would say, is actually uh, a Robinsonard. It, it, it comes from that same genre. And I saw that film when I was 15 years old and was utterly captivated by the idea of being stranded on a desert island. Getting to one turned out to be a lot more complicated. I ended up advertising uh, in the same way that Lucy uh, was involved in an adv advertisement uh, and going off to an island. It didn't work out with the first girl. She left uh, and then another girl Friday came and joined me and we kind of got to that sort of experience which I was hoping to recreate of building our own house and living in part the whole idyll of living on a desert island. Tell me, Martin, about Crusoe's early life. Something that surprised me reading the book is how much happened to him, how much detail there is before he even gets to his desert island. This is the thing, I think when people think of Robinson Crusoe, they just think of the island and nothing else. But there's a whole huge portion of the book before that, which starts with him being told by his dad not to go off and, you know, to, to sort of get a sensible job, be a lawyer or whatever. And then he ends up going off on the sort of first part of his adventure, which involves him being held captive for two years mm. as a slave himself in Morocco. Then he manages to escape with, uh, and in fact, another slave, and he ends up going to uh, the Brazils, as he puts it. Um, rather cruelly, he kind of sells the slave that he escaped with to the captain on the boat. And he then spends some time in Brazil, becoming quite successful as a, a plantation owner, and then goes off on another adventure. Uh, and that's where the bits that, that everybody that knows. Everybody knows. Yes. I hadn't realised how long he was deserted. 28 years, says the book, and just how boring it must have been. Let me read an extract from early on. December the 24th, much rain all night and all day, no stirring out. December the 25th, rain all day. December the 26th, no rain and the earth much cooler than before and pleasanter. December the 27th, killed a young goat. I have to say, that passage doesn't exactly sell it as a, a page turner, does it? Well, I think you've been maybe a little bit mean in the bits that you chose. <laughs> there are all sorts of other exciting bits. I mean, it, 28 years, though, as you point out, is a hugely long time. If, if we're going to start digging into some of the detail of Defoe and Crew, so um, there could be some hidden meaning in that 28 years because it equals the time between the restoration of the monarchy and the glorious revolution and that mm. is important mm -hmm, for Defoe mm -hmm. but 28 years gosh uh, you would go insane <laughs> yeah. I mean uh, well uh, oh, yes or you would change so irrevocably that you couldn't just fit into civilization again I think it would be, be impossible to me that uh, the fact that he was able to go back and become a, a businessman again and have new ventures doesn't ring very true no no, Lu Lucy, I think you're as interested in Crusoe's creator, Defoe, as you are in the character. Tell me a little bit more about Daniel Defoe. What, what do we know about his early life? He was born in extraordinary times into a dissenter's family, which in a very much Church of England, uh, England, was quite a difficult thing to be. Even as a young child, uh, he had to go to a special school and uh, he was barred from going to Oxford or Cambridge, which his father would have liked. So everything was dictated by religion. You begin to see where all that uh, banging on on the island comes from. And he ended and up in jail. Lived, didn't, tell tell well, me about that. Uh, uh, he lived through the fire of London, apparently his house was one of only three to be standing in his part of London. And then there was the plague. So, I mean, th this is a man uh, who, if he was really going to be a castaway or on his own wits, as he many times was, he was the right person to do it. He'd lived through an awful lot before he even came to maturity. And possibly running away as well, uh, because, oh, yes. because Defoe was 
bankrupt mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Uh, he actually ended up in jail a couple of times. The, the most famous incident for him ending up in prison uh, came about because he was a pamphleteer. So in, in, in those days, being a pamphleteer meant you, you sort of put these pages, of sort of 30 pages together on a political issue or whatever. And he basically wrote a satirical attack on the way the government was treating dissenters, Presbyterians, and got charged with seditious libel, which put simply means that, it, that he was writing something which could lead to an uprising or an insurrection. Found guilty and was put in the pillory, which basically meant the yeah. stocks, which they moved yeah. around to three different locations in London, and you could you could end up getting serious injuries, people perhaps through yeah. unfortunate and, and things. Then, I mean, and we call cannibal savage. To me, that's an extraordinary punishment. With your head bent forward and your arms stuck through holes, your back must have ached tremendously, and for three days... In three different locations. Yeah. He, he strikes me, uh, reading some of his work, as a, a bit of a sort of um, 17th century, 18th century red-top journalist. His output Definitely. is amazing. Mole Flanders, yeah. a journal of the plague year, a tour through the whole island of Great Britain, the political history of the, the devil. But what about the really uh, racy-pacy stuff that he started writing when he was nearly 70? <laughs> One of them was entitled uh, Matrimonial Whoredom, or a treatise on the use and abuse of the marriage bed. Now, that was sheer <laughs> journalist hood, yes. wasn't it? I mean, he put that title out there. It was immediately withdrawn. Shock horror, but people were gagging to read it. So then it went out just with the treatise name. And oh. he, he says of, his, uh, of himself, no man has tasted differing fortunes more and 13 times I have been rich and poor. Absolutely right. Roller coaster of a life. He was a spy for a while too, wasn't he? Yes, not a spy in the form of sort of James Bond mm. but he would basically go around listening to what people were saying so that this was before the act of union between mm. uh, England uh, and Scotland or, or around about the time he was up there listening to what people were saying uh, and reporting back to very senior people within government in, in, in London as to what was going on and what people were saying or what people were thinking so he was a spy in that sense but before the spying, before the right he was a trader uh, and he mm. basically was involved in, in selling pants, knickers and, and tights <laughs> hosiery I think is, is, uh, is the term uh, also had a brick factory randomly out yeah. in Tilbury in Essex <laughs> he ha- had a very very full and diverse life You're listening yeah. to Great Lives with Lucy Irvin and Martin Popplewell Today we're looking at the life of Daniel Defoe Lucy, was there an inspiration Uh, for the life and adventures of Robinson Crusoe written by himself. Was Daniel Defoe basing this on anyone else's experience? Oh, I'm sure that he'd have uh, collected lots and lots of different stories from sailors, from people he met in jail, and uh, put them all together. And I'm sure that uh, somewhere along the line, Alexander Selkirk's story came to him. Alexander Selkirk was uh, a castaway who lived off the coast of Chile for a while when he was genuinely cast away. For four years, I think it was, Gerald, my husband of a year, went and lived on the same island. But... I don't think that Alexander Selkirk was the one base for the story of uh, Robinson Crusoe, and uh, I understand that academicians feel that it's absolutely impossible that this was uh, all taken from one person, one person's story. Do you think some people like Crusoe or Selkirk, or or you, Lucy, or perhaps you, Martin, have a higher threshold for for loneliness than than others, or, or... do we delude ourselves that we we can just be alone and not go crazy? I couldn't do it now. I think you know it, I did it when I was much younger and for a much shorter period of time. And if I went back there now, I would go bonkers within a, a, a few days, mm. <laughs> alone a few years. And so I think I think you know your horizons when you're young are, are much narrower. I, I'm not sure about Lucy, but I couldn't go back. Did you go bonkers, Lucy? If I did, I still am, because (laughs) I'm still doing it, (laughs) in a sense. Uh, I mean, when I uh, came back from Toon Island, I spent some time, in a sense, trying to be normal. I had a family, but as soon as that family was old enough 
to go off to Desert Island. That's what I did, because I felt the benefits of uh, that year that I'd had on Tuin Island were so great, I wanted my children to have such benefits themselves. And that's the story of um, the year that I spent with my younger sons out in the Solomon Islands um, on a five-acre speck. You're a glutton, um, glutton for punishment. I'm a glutton, yeah. May, may I read a little uh, quote from one of your, your books? With a little pirouette of inner excitement, I realised just how much there was to look forward to tomorrow. The thought of being naked all day in the sun was delicious enough, but there was the whole of our new world to explore. Why are we so drawn to this tale of those who choose to live so independently? Why why has it taken root in our culture in, in, in the way it has? I think it's because most people's lives seem to them, at some stage at least, very complicated, very demanding. I didn't know which way to turn and there were so many possibilities. So I was looking for simplicity and I think a great many people are. It's about having your own kingdom. Can I just uh, try to find a bit that I absolutely love uh, in Robinson Crusoe? Can you give me a second? Yes, absolutely. Uh, It would have made a stoic smile to have seen me and my little family sit down to dinner. There was my majesty, the prince and lord of the whole island. I had the lives of all my subjects at my absolute command. I could hang, draw, give liberty, take it away. No rebels among all my subjects. I mean, that's a big monarch of all these surveys and some, isn't it? (laughs) Who wrote that? That's in Robinson Crusoe. Oh, is it? Yes. Selkirk himself, in his The Solitude of Alexander Selkirk, says, I am monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. Isn't there something a little bit selfish, Martin, about uh, the idea of having your own little kingdom, as, as you put it. When you read Robinson Crusoe, he is really miserable, at least initially. He learns mm. to love the island and le- learns to realise how lucky he is. But That's initially a he's... technique, I'm sure. Well, well exactly, a... exactly. Yeah. But, it, but I can't help thinking... The, when people probably read it as well, they would have thought how horrible to have been stranded yeah. away. Somewhere in the last 300 years... The idea has morphed from being something which is terrible and Mm. a a terrible affliction to being something hugely desirable, to being a utopian Mm. idea. Mm. And uh, and, and Mm -hmm. it's wrong, but it's a really important thing to observe about how the Mm. castaway myth has evolved in the last Mm. 300 years. And I think people have changed so much in their attitude to it. For instance, I, I didn't feel at all, this is my kingdom. I felt very humbled by being... A, a minuscule and inconsequential speck on an island. Uh, every evening I would walk out onto a sand spit when the tide was low and I would realise how how little and unimportant I was and how huge and terrifying and also magnificent nature was, if you like. And I wouldn't say this is in harmony with nature. It's more like being in awe of something you can't control. You can't control it. So this thing about uh, forming a kingdom on an island, to me, is like an att- attempt at controlling in order to stay sane, if you like. And also, I mean, it's of its time, isn't it? It's empire building. And uh, if ever there was uh, an imperialist imperialist, uh, cultural colonial, that has to be Robinson Crusoe. Absolutely, Lucy. And let's hear another extract from the book, which this leads us straight to. This time it's about Crusoe's companion, Friday. The days after the discovery of the footprint were a turmoil of doubt and fear. I hid in my cave, too frighted to venture forth, except on brief excursions. I never went without my gun, although I did not use it for fear of alerting my enemies, but took to snaring game and fishing. Each morning, I climbed the hill behind my cave and spied my island, always looking towards the west to see if there were any visitors. I see it clearly now. The footprint was a vision sent to be a test of my faith. For what mortal man can leave one footprint on an entire shore? Fear of danger is a thousand times more terrifying than danger itself. The summit. The air is good and fresh. The sun shines, the sea is perfect. My island is a garden of Eden. 
Lucy, are you comfortable with Crusoe's relationship with Friday? No, I'm not comfortable with it, but that's because I'm a person of my time, and Defoe, who created Crusoe, was a person of his time, and it was in the way of things for Defoe to make his character, Crusoe, immediately see this savage as inferior to him and somebody to enslave and be useful to him. And we, we, we have uh, quite near the beginning of their relationship, the moment when um, Friday puts Crusoe's foot on his head, uh, and this is a sort of ultimate act of maybe rather wishful submission, and uh, people must have seen a, a wonderful satirical adaptation of the Crusoe story called Man Friday, with uh, starring Peter O'Toole and his wonderful perfect for Desert Island eyes. In that, uh, he teaches uh, Friday to be exactly like an English schoolboy. Uh, there's a beautiful scene where they're eating for the first time together and of course Friday's sitting a bit down and uh, the body language is all I'm master, you slave. And when he names him Friday, he, he gives Friday a name but he doesn't have a name, he's master. I master, you Friday. <laughs> uh, don't play about with your spoon. I wonder... Uh, Martin, whether um, there isn't just a missionary instinct at play here, <laughs> do you do you sense any sort of gay subtext to the relationship with Friday? In the book, in Robinson Crusoe, there is nothing, no reference at all. Mm. The only thing which does come out from the book is um, Crusoe is really, really fond of Friday in a way that I would imagine that he had a, a, an affection for him that I suspect would have not have been the same kind of affection that a slave owner would have had. Yeah, with or the slave. readers would necessarily have expected. Exactly. And it's also important to point out that uh, Friday was actually not a black African. He was from the, sort of no. the Caribbean, from those mm. islands there. What some scholars of Defoe have said is that Defoe was homosexual. Obviously we'll never know. But there are a number of people who have pointed to that. And it's interesting that, you know, it wasn't a woman that he he ended up being on an island with. It was a man. The film of Martin's experience out on a speck of Micronesia was called The Real Castaway. And at one point he starts talking about being terrified of going back because of the sheer numbers of people, options, choices, people. Uh, I, I remember being more daunted about going back to the UK than I felt going to my desert island. Maybe it's because when you're living on a desert island, it's very, very simple. It's a matter of about clocking the fact that you perhaps haven't got enough firewood and so you should perhaps go and collect some driftwood or make sure that you uh, open up some dry coconuts to add to your, your fuel and so yes uh, and I remember as well we had occasional visitors from another island about 10 miles away that was the closest inhabited land but they always came during the day and they were friendly <laughs> we knew them and we'd hear the boat in the, the distance and we'd see them approaching I remember one night hearing this boat and Rachel, my companion and I, we were terrified. Did you, Lucy, develop this fear of other people while you were on the island? Yes. Uh, in, in fact, uh, during part of the time when I was on the island, towards the end, when Gerald, uh, my husband, was starting to mend um, engines for uh, local islanders, I started to resent their coming. I just wanted to go back to being alone on the island, and actually that's what I did. I said to Gerald, look, we've come here for a year. I want to stay here. And Gerald would go off to another island, and, and uh, he would stay with the chief of Badu, and I would stay alone on Tuin. An author who explored um, a, a different theme, but uh, along the same lines, is uh, J.M. Coetzee, who, of course, uh, wrote Foe, a book called Foe, which is all about a woman landing on the island and kind of living between Friday and Robinson Crusoe. Um, and she actually has her way with Crusoe and ends up going off with Friday. It's a, <laughs> it's a marvellous book, actually. But, um, no, it's, it's very, but don't you think also that, I mean, it, it may not have necessarily been that 
that uh, Crusoe was gay or Friday gay, but perhaps because they were so dependent on each other, they had to form an unusually close relationship. What's interesting, though, is... uh, Sorry to interrupt. They had to form a close relationship, but there's no there's no really in the book where Crusoe gets annoyed with Friday. We obviously don't know what Friday's mm-hmm. thinking, and I just can't help thinking my experiences of living on an island. I think all of our experiences of being on a holiday with friends. Yes. If you're cooped up mm-hmm. with one other person for a while, mm-hmm. you will probably end up having a row about something, and those those rows <laughs> matter to you. But there's no reference to them yeah. in Robinson no. Crusoe at all. The other thing, just as an aside, which fascinated me, there are no reference to coconuts. And when you are on a desert island <laughs> in the Caribbean, it's all about coconuts! You can drink <laughs> them, you can eat them, you can make alcohol out of them, you can make vinegar out of them, you can make thatch to put on your your roof to yeah. keep you dry exactly. but there is no reference to the coconut tree no. in in robinson crusoe no. and that, to, yeah, instead there's reference to corn and rice so you're, yes. you're exactly right. I mean, it's not yeah, where did that come from <laughs> now, now lucy yeah. very, very briefly how does crusoe's story end so there are i suppose two answers to this there's the end to the robinson crusoe book and and he crucially discovers that uh, the island is being visited by cannibals some mutineers arrive and basically he helps the captain get control of the ship and then leaves and then there's this rather sort of strange bit of the book where he makes his way back to the uk over the pyrenees and is chased by i think about 300 wolves i mean it's all mad i mean you're just like thinking where do the these ideas come from that's the end of the robinson crusoe first book he did of course write a second book which i'll give you the short version of is called the the further adventures of, <laughs> yes, of, of robinson crusoe yeah the sequel came out the same year because it had been such a success in 1719 the first one um, where he goes off on on a whole load of adventures poor old friday gets killed uh, he he does actually go back to his island interestingly enough but uh, ends up going to madagascar and siberia and all sorts of other places defoe through the mouth of crusoe admit almost from the start that his adventures were reckless and foolish lucy first and and then martin was it silly what you did it was reckless and foolish i don't know about silly uh, but i don't regret it one bit it's uh, informed every day of my life since i could not do the very difficult work that i'm doing at the moment uh, helping animals in need among the Roma community, helping children, seeing horrible sights every day of cruelty and so on. I couldn't do it without having the island experience. And I couldn't have coped when my house burnt down two years after I moved to Bulgaria. It was just automatic. I went straight back into castaway mode. Mm -hmm. Um, Right, I'm going to camp. Fine. (laughs) I would completely agree with Lucy. Uh, Reckless and an experience which is defined absolutely without doubt everything that has come after it that knowledge that actually you don't need very much to survive Hmm, my thanks to lucy irvin in bulgaria and to martin popplewell in the warmth and safety of this london studio goodbye